I'll tell you afterwards whether it was a pleasure to be here or not. <laughs> but I'm grateful to be invited. Um, uh, it's a, an odd thing whenever one is addressing a particular topic like democracy. Um, one doesn't really want to go to books of quotations to find out what the ages have said about these terms because you're not likely to get a very good read. So let me read you just a few <laughs> quotes about democracy. Some of my I mean, it's hard to pick out the best of the lot. This is Churchill. The best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> H.L. Mencken. Democracy is a pathetic belief in the collective wisdom of individual ignorance. Hmm. This is as I'm preparing, you know, a talk on the democratic frame of mind and why I believe it's important. Flaubert. The whole dream of democracy is to raise the proletariat to the level of bourgeois stupidity. <laughs> okay, now Marx, thank God. <laughs> democracy is the road to socialism. Yes, I needed that. And of course, the following. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Donald Trump. <laughs> oh no, Walt Whitman. I'm so sorry. I, that was a slip. Okay. Where I'm going to head this evening, and then look forward very much to what you're going to say because of troubled times, and democracy is in troubled times, obviously, in different respects. Um, I'll start with a discussion of its predicates, the predicates of democracy, the doubts about democracy. Then I'm going to go to why I think it is indeed um, a theory of the mind, and at the same time, uh, implicitly, therapeutics, why it's therapeutic, and how and in what ways uncannily psychoanalysis picks up on the democratic tradition, perhaps without recognition, acknowledgement, builds on it, develops it, and why nowadays, instead of um, deciding, well, we're split between the 40% who are for this issue or the 40% who are for that issue and so on and so forth. We're going to have to come together, not in a kind of kumbaya moment, which is impossible, but we're, we're going to have to recognize the strengths of democracy. Because as I expect many of you know, there's an argument, a serious argument in the States amongst many very gifted writers uh, who are arguing on behalf of epistocracy, that is, abandonment of um, the democracies that we live with now um, and movement towards um, uh, a qualified electorate based upon their pool of knowledge. How well educated are they? This is not new. It's not new. This is what Plato and Aristotle were fussing about, what John Stuart Mill was thinking about. It's something that all people who have had to live with democracy have thought about from its early days. And it's understandable. That, in other words, one like, for example, Hillary Clinton might wish to get rid of the deplorables. Okay? So I am going to address that ultimately. And if I don't, my God, someone should raise their hand that you have not addressed the main question. Um, but let's go over, in the first place, what we understand to be, in a sense, the basic dimensions of a democracy and then discuss them. Because I'm going to link this up to our tradition here in Great Britain of um, the concept of the internal world and indeed the concept of um, that within the group. Not just the internal world of the individual, but the internal world of the group, which I believe share um, 
many of the same assumptions that, they, that are embedded in democratic theory or the theory of democracy. All right. So in the first place, democracy is the free assembly of peoples. Right? It's the, right, it's the free association of individuals. There are other things, and I'll come to them. But that is the, perhaps the most important thing. It's the right to assemble. What's interesting to me, if one looks at the literature here, whether it's Plato or Aristotle, whether it's Hume or others, and, or contemporary writers, is that although there are very real doubts about giving that kind of power to, uh, to individuals, to, um, to, to, to citizens, this is the word that's used, to the citizen, uh, especially from the 18th century, um, we're not just citizens, are we? We are, in fact, personalities. We're different from one another. So when we think here of the free assembly of people or individuals or citizens, we're really talking about a, a group process in which there's going to be a free movement of highly different people. We share many things in common, and I'll come to that in a while. But we're also forms of being, aren't we? I mean, we're different from one another. We look differently from one another. We uh, have different effects upon people. We leave differing impressions upon people. I have uh, described this as our idiom. Um, it's very hard to describe this. But, well, if we take a bit of a break and I say, all right, we receive impressions. Freud was very interested in how we're impressed before the verbal era, before we can use language, we're very impressionable. So his theory is a theory of what he calls thing impressions. I'm sure many of you know this. But for those who, who are not so familiar with Freud's thinking, basically, they, infants are impressionable. So those impressions then um, evolve into axioms that constitute the very early ego of the self. OK, fair enough. Now, though we, uh, uh, this is character development, where this is really before, quote unquote, mental life proper. It's really before language proper. And the, the, the being that we are as characters will communicate itself in any assembly, in any group meeting. And it will have a lasting impression not just on the top of one's mind, it kind of goes inside ourselves in what Freud would call clusters of thought. Uh, Melanie Klein, perhaps, the internal objects. So I'm going to give you a name, and let's see if you have an impression that would be an internal fabric created out of this name. Okay? Jeremy Corbyn. So you've had a bit of time to experience your internal resonance here, your endopsychic perceptions. I'm not talking about looking at pictures or notes or whatever. I'm talking about what registers inside you as you think of that name. Now, some of you have met him. Um, I haven't. Most of you probably have not. So this is distant, but that's, you can feel it inside you. Let me give you another name. Donald Trump. Now, without thinking about either of these two names much, each name will evoke within you a constellation of highly complicated ideas, emotions, associations, that it would be impossible to sort out. We've, we've not met these people. So imagine then what it's like to meet people, to experience them in their impression upon us, and how we carry them inside us uh, for the rest of our lives, perhaps. But certainly, if we're within a group, within a democratic process, it's not possible to uh, divorce the character of the speaker from the impression they create within us. 
This is unconscious communication. It's before language. It's extremely subtle, but it's the basis of why people, I think, in part are attracted to one another or repelled by one another. Extremely difficult to word, isn't it? Very hard to describe this. So one of the interesting aspects of the democratic process, and I'll get to the, to the free movement of ideas, is the free assembly of very different characters in the same room. Very different. And I would argue that that fact alone, if, it, if there was no other accomplishment of the democratic process, that fact alone is worth the entire enterprise. Because whatever our initial impressions, first impressions, there will be second, there will be third, there will be multiple impressions. And then over time, we'll start to shift and change. We're deeply unconsciously receiving the other person's character communications. This is terribly important. Okay. So the democratic process allows people to meet each other. I think to some extent there's a difference between the virtuals and the actuals, between how we imagine people in our minds before we've met them, and then we actually meet the actual. Uh, it can be quite sobering and quite disconcerting. I can't recall the name of the politician that Hillary Clinton confronted about a month ago who had excoriated her during the election, and she reminded him of what she had said about him, and he turned white because actually he was meeting the, the actual person, not the virtual reality in his mind. In his mind, she was fair game for anything he wanted to project into her. When she confronted him and said, by the way, I am the person that you were talking about, you know. He, lo he looked pale as if this was a category error. Surely not. You can't possibly be the Hillary Clinton I was really talking about. Well, actually, I am flesh and blood Hillary Clinton. This is me. So he didn't know what to do with this, but we don't know what to do with this. In some ways, we could say, well, well this is the, always the, the, the tension, isn't it, between internal life, inter the internal world of mental representations, and the actual world of, let's call it, interaction, or let's call it interactional, uh, the in interactions are really forms of intersubjectivity, aren't they? When you see when you're with people in a room, you interact. Interesting phrase, isn't it? You, if you just slow it down and think about it, we are involved in interactions. These days we might call them um, uh, uh, actings out or other terms that psychoanalysts use for this, but this is what happens. So this follows on to some extent from our character, the way we are as characters, but we are going to engage with other characters. They're going to be an interaction. Now, again, we're going to, let's go back to the, demo, to the Greek democratic room, let's call it the democratic state, um, to think about what it brings, what does it create, what is it doing. So it allows people to express their characters, to have impressions upon one another, it allows them as well then to interact with each other, to communicate through actions, including verbal actions, the elocutionary action of Austin and Searle. In other words, when we speak, we're not just communicating um, contents, we're having an effect upon another person through our speech, um, which those of us interested in the transference and the countertransference will understand is a constant inside any analytical session or any human uh, engagement uh, that is there's always a rhetorical dimension to human speech. There's always an active dimension to what we speak, to what we say and how we say it, isn't there? Uh, and to its effect. So that's all I'm going to say here about the, the assembly of individuals. We could talk about that an awful lot more. Well, I will make a parenthesis. I was very fortunate in the 1980s to spend summers in St. Ives. And there I met a very gifted um, labor politician, Peter Shore. And Peter was an, he was an offbeat. I don't know if anyone knew him. A remarkably brilliant man who was not a party politician, to say the least. Um, but he talked a lot about personalities in, in the party, in the Labour Party, and the effect of, that people would have on one another, <clears throat> and the impediments to thinking 
who was difficult, who was easy to talk to, who was impossible to talk to, and so on. But actually what struck me about his way of putting this was it didn't bother him in the least. He took this as simply um, an aspect of the process itself. And I, I respected his perspective enormously. Um, and so I mention that now. All right, the second dimension of the group process here, that is the democratic process, is the free movement of ideas. So if we're psychoanalytically, if we're interested in psychoanalysis, in free association, there's the free association of individuals, there's the free association of ideas. So you have a group of people who are meeting to uh, discuss political affairs, and they're going to have highly divergent positions, very different from one another. And I'm not going to say any more about that because it's so obvious to all of you in this room why spend the time discussing that kind of obvious dimension. On the other hand, it's important to stress it because the freedom of thought here is terribly important. The freedom to think, the right to have um, a free mind is essential to the democratic process. Um, after this, we can say that there is the free movement of emotions, which is a more precarious situation, let us say. <clears throat> that is, this is what frightened Plato and Aristotle. Um, John Stuart Mill, it frightens um, theoreticians this day, namely individuals in a group can develop very strange emotional states, come to very bizarre positions, and we would seem to be at the mercy of this possibility, of this prospect. And there are enough people around and about who think that that alone is enough to warrant a profound reconsideration of the democratic process because after all, whatever their emotional states, they are going to determine the future. If they're going to go and vote, it's an electorate, and we have to abide by their decision, we are imperiled. So what are we this is presumably those who are in disagreement with the decision that's being made. What are we going to do about it? Okay. Um, so these are the, in a sense, features of the democratic process. This is what happens in a in a in, in the better parts of government. Or, but I want to make uh, it clear as well here, and especially from where I'm going to move now. Um, a democracy or the democratic process is by no means restricted to or government and certainly did not begin in 7th, 6th and 5th century Athens. Um, there are democracies all over the world in all kinds of cultures. There is an argument, the serious argument, that hunter-gatherers with earliest forms of, of decision-making were democratic ones uh, where women and men had equal rights with each other. And so uh, therefore, we might think that this axiom that the group will have to speak freely, that we need to speak freely, may, it, it, it is very ancient possibly, goes way back, very diverse, and certainly does not come from Athens. Okay. So, let's move forward a bit to where... I would love to read some Hume to you, but we don't have any time. But Hume in On Liberty, I think, faces very, very clearly the anxieties that uh, were promoted to some extent by both Plato and by Aristotle and by everyone else afterwards, which is this is a very precarious situation to be in. Democracies, you can't trust them. What he said, which is interesting, is he looked back at the, the function of the orator at Cicero, and he said wait a minute, um, a reflective person, very interesting term, a reflective person, this is in his essay on liberty in 1859, a reflective person when proposing something to the group has to really listen to the response. And he says that the act of listening includes bearing the impact of that person's emotional response to you 
because it's only in that way that you will be truly informed of their position. And the responsibility of the orator, of the reflective person, is to take all of this in without resistance. It's extraordinary. I recommend that you read him. Um, now, yes, it's the case that he believes at the end of the day there is a rational solution to the problem of the errant mind. That's, in other words, through argument, through rhetoric, through confrontation, etc. Um, errant views can be brought into the light of day and human beings will become uh, more rational selves. Okay. Um, the, although Freud certainly recognized the um, uh, destructive dimensions of humankind, uh, his response to the First World War uh, in his letters, etc., when he said it shattered all of his beliefs in mankind, this was in a letter to uh, Lou Andreas Salome, um, indicate that, that whatever he was thinking about when he conceptualized the human destructiveness was not on the scale of the First World War. In other words, he was shocked by it. Um, to some extent, we could say that someone like Gustave Le Bon, who Freud, of course, cited, had perhaps a better sense of the volatility of mob psychology, of mass psychology, and I think in a more viscerally adept sense than Freud had at the time. But certainly post-War I and post-War II, we come here to the Tavistock and to Beyond's uh, study of groups, and there is a revolution in thinking about group life. There has to be. All of the predicates uh, of uh, Judeo-Christian uh, beliefs, all of those of um, of the humanist assumptions deriving from the Renaissance, everything that comes out of Greece and Rome, uh, all of these, uh, these uh, ideas, convictions, that brought us together as a civilization were destroyed by the middle part of the 20th century. The existential movement is collective and profound mourning. That's what it is. Trying to find one way or the other to come up with something to live by. So for a Camus, the question is, do you kill yourself or not? After a couple of thousand years, that's what we come to. But I think that um, Camus and others were very astutely in touch with a deep depression, a mourning, a melancholia even, within the 20th century. Well. Of course, this is going to affect democratic processes, isn't it? To what extent are we going to be thinking collectively? To what extent can we believe in uh, the democratic process? Because to some extent we could say, well, surely it's failed us. Now, earlier I said that democracy, the Greek theory of democracy, is based upon the mind. And just a moment ago, it's a theory of the mind. I mentioned Beyond's transformation in groups. Let's go back to that. What Beyond sees, not consciously, because to my knowledge he did not say, aha, the group is a democracy. His one of his biographers did think that's what Beyond found. But what Beyond discovered, and he was not the only one, this is out of Klein's thinking as well and others, is that the group represents all aspects of the human mind. That the way we think in groups, that everyone in one of Beyond's groups is um, representing all of us. Now, I was trained in this at the Tavistock in the 1970s. That was before some of you even began to have grandchildren. <laughs> um, so back then, the remarkable uh, revelation for me of this was the interpretation that when anyone would say something in a group, especially 
Bob speaking to Ted. I can't stand you. You're constantly taking up so much time in this room, and we don't what, you don't give us any time to talk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The the analytical response would be. The group wonders if there will ever be enough time. Uh, so the weight is taken off the shoulder of the individual. We're not going to talk about Bob and Ted. This is not America. Gee, Ted, why don't you tell us how you feel about what Bob just told you? <laughs> no, 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 no. The group thinks that is an extraordinary moment, I believe, in, in the history of thinking and the concept of group life, especially the democratic process, because that is the democratic process. That group says, each of us, we're equal. Someone may be expressing a bizarre point of view, but you know what? It's not so bizarre that we can disown it. Each one in the group speaks for every one in the group. Profoundly liberating. Profoundly liberating. So, uh, uh, let's say a borderline personality or a narcissistic personality or, you know, you name it. They're usually getting in trouble one way or the other, aren't they? They get into a group like this where they not expect the usual sorts of responses to their argy-bargies, one way or the other, character problems. And they're not going to have the same response because whatever they say, they're not going to be isolated. They're going to be brought into the group and the group goes along with all of its members as part of the, let's call it, journey, the boat, ship. One of the, I, I had a group there for three years. Uh, and it was an extraordinary experience. Um, I think when the members of the group become accustomed to one another, uh, they form uh, a group mind. I believe a group mind can be formed. And later, if, if I can remember it, or someone can remind me of it, this is where I want us to head as to how we form groups that can develop minds that can think through conflicts between the members of the group in the political area of life, in, in, in conflict areas. We need to grow up. We need to mature because we're living in an age of psychological stupidity, incredibly <coughs> psychological regression. We are psychologically um, arrested as a, not just Western civilization, around the world. There's been almost no psychological evolution at all. And I will come to that later when I talk about psychophobia. So when the individual, it, it, when the group understands that nobody is going to be isolated like this, it, individuals start to tolerate one another. Also, there were silences. Some people would stop talking. Or there were these moments where one person would start a sentence, get somewhere towards the middle part of the sentence or mid-paragraph, and another person would finish it. And nobody, we didn't notice. Again, remember, silences. It's kind of like a friends meeting. I don't know if you've ever been to a Quaker meeting, but it's sort of like society of friends meeting. Also, there were these sort of Beckett moments, almost um, some sort of like uh, uh, locational metaphysical perambulation uh, in which someone would use the, the pronoun it. Well, it's what, like this, or it was like, and nobody knows what it is anymore. I didn't know what it was anymore. We didn't care what it was, but whatever it was, it didn't matter. Because it just simply meant that whatever people were referring to was, un uh, was unconsciously connected by the whole group. So what you found here was a group of people trusting each other, working together. They had constructed their own mind. Um, and 
without being uh, going over the top about this, I do want to say that I think after a while it became, as a group, a form of love. I think it did. Um, I think to some extent love is understanding. It's being understood. And to be loving is to be understanding. I would put that first on the list of the qualities of what constitutes love. Not uh, the more over-the-top uh, versions of it, but the, this to, 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 so when you get that kind of um, trust, that kind of work between 8, 10, 15 people, you really have an evolved democratic phenomenon. Now, as much as I respect the world of politics, and I do, as much as I think politicians are more evolved than we are, frankly, I think they show a remarkable, for, I'm not speaking of all politicians, but I think they show a remarkable ability to contain multitudes within them, to survive profound conflicts. Um, I do think it's, it's time for us to begin to rethink the democratic process, to link what we've learned from uh, groups and how we know that the mind functions. Uh, briefly, I'll mention this. I'm, I feel like I'm bringing coals to Newcastle, so I apologize. But the internal world metaphor simply takes the group metaphor we've just been talking about and applies it to the self so that we have all these parts of the self in divergent states with one another. In other words, we disagree with ourselves, we have passing emotions and so on and so forth. Now, if one has an open mind, one is open to the complexity of being a self, right? You're open to it. I mean, it's not necessarily great, but if you're not so aware of it, you're more receptive to the extraordinary number of possibilities, aren't you? Different gravities within the unconscious will draw different things to them, there's a, deg a greater degree of unconscious freedom, of unconscious movement, of, of unconscious thinking, etc. So um, that's a, a, a valued part uh, of, 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 of the process. Um, of course, th that mind, that democratic process, can be destroyed by paranoid uh, uh, organizations or its opposite, because I'm not going to go here and discuss the paranoid um, squeezing of the democratic mind, but because you, you, know, you've got the, you can look around you at an American, if any time you want to watch, you need a refresher course, just tune in to CNN for about an hour, and you'll, you'll have your dose of, the, of looking at the paranoid activities. I'm being disparaging, and I shouldn't be. I'm sort of typifying here the very thing I'm arguing against, because I'm using a term, paranoia, to, in a sense, be critical of a process that's inside group life, which is inside all of us, including myself. So, um, but the paranoid dimensions cannot bear the complexity of the mind, right? So it will go for selected facts. And uh, unfortunately, it's terribly pleasurable. Um, if you get rid of complexity and you can just go with one powerful idea, it's just kind of delicious. <laughs> You know, it's, it's like being a sports fan. I mean, uh, when Arsenal was winning, and they're not anymore, so I'm forced into a depressive position. But when Arsenal was winning, uh, I, uh, I, I was so happy, you know. And, uh, it, but, but anyway, the, the, um, then the other side of the coin, because paranoia we all know about, the, the part that I think is harder for us to see is what I call sanctimonious rectitude. And that's the, para, that's the, the paranoia of righteousness, in which... Uh, individuals and groups of people, especially on the left, sorry to put it to my friends, but especially on the left, is a kind of collective self-beatification. You know, it's like we just stand up and march. Aren't we wonderful to march? Don't we look at each Aren't we seeing each other marching? Aren't we marching all together? And isn't this just wonderful? And isn't that enough? No, I'm sorry, it's not. It's the politics of narcissism on the left. It's self-beatifying. It's like we're anointing ourselves in the grace of our own mirrors. So we have to grow up on the left. We have to understand more about the right-wing paranoid politics. 
We have to live with them because guess what? They're no different. We're no different from one another. We all contain the same elements within the mind. But this is where we don't, this is when democracy is in trouble. Why? Well, because it arranges for meetings we don't necessarily want to have. We don't necessarily want to talk to people we disagree with. In fact, we're pretty good at arranging not to. And to put something, to flag something up that I would like, if I lived long enough, to see reconsidered, is the whole idea of party politics. Really? Is our party politics really, 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 really in the interests of democracy? Or are they sort of like almost ersatz gangs of groupies hanging out um, in such a way that their conventions are profoundly embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic convention, whether it's labor, whether it's the conservatives, honest to God, I tell you, if they're over the age of 16 psychologically, great. That's an accomplishment. But it looks like a group of adolescents. It's adolescent. We have to grow up. You have to grow up. That also means the depression of taking into the act of growing up to recognize the extraordinary creativity uh, present in the democratic process. Because the burden here on all of us is we are all in this together, and by God, we're going to have to find a way to keep talking to each other. And I don't care how bad you think the other person is. I don't care how awful you think they are. And, you know, people are going to say some pretty awful things. They're going to say some horrible things. You're going to be in a room with people who would kill. Right? You're going to be in, in a room with people who commit intellectual genocide which I wrote about in an essay called The Fascist State of Mind long, long ago. No, you're going to be in a room where people are killing each other with words. They're mangling, distorting, and destroying each other. But if we follow the Tavistock model, in a way, if we have a consultant present, if we have psychology present, then we can find someone who will contain these toxic communications, find some way to reword them without destroying the speaker's sense of the integrity of his anger or of his position, and make it possible for the group to digest these communications and to think about them. Um, in a way, this is an argument for something that we might think of as thoughtfulness. Whether we can develop ourselves towards thoughtfulness instead of the knee-jerk reactiveness that is so endemic to politics around the world. Um, I think a question that all people in politics and who care about politics, whether it's the politics of government or the politics of organizations, need to think to themselves why there is such, because we've developed the sciences, my gosh, look what's happened in the world of medicine, in physics, in technology. Look at the apps we've got. Everything is extraordinary. Elon Musk will take us to Mars in, in time to get off the planet before it explodes. Um, look at what's happening. But why is there psychological stupidity? Why is there psychophobia? Now, psychoanalysts can become overly persecuted and think this is just anti-psychoanalytical. And yeah, sure, we're not popular. But no, it's not anti-psychoanalytic. It's anti-mind. It's against the mind. It's against the life of the mind. It's against thinking. And of course, psychoanalysis is associated with thinking. That's why we love the brain. We love to look at the brain and say, you know what, there it is. It doesn't have a mind, but that's okay. It's us. No, I'm sorry, the brain and the mind are not the same thing. They're just not. I like the brain. I'm glad I've got one. You know, but, uh, you know, they don't have much to do with each other, really. Uh, and I think that the, that the idea, though, that we can concretize 
uh, the invisibles, as Hannah Arendt termed it, the invisibles of the internal world, that we can somehow find a location for the mind, is kind of like trying to find a location for democracy. Well, where are you going to find it? I'm sorry, but it's not that visible. It is, it's, it's either there or it's not there. So um, before I stop, and it will be shortly, um, I think that, and you know, obviously I know where I'm speaking. I know who, who we are here. Many of you, I know many of you. Uh, and I grew up here, basically, from the age of 29. Um, I think psychoanalysts and those who care about psychodynamic psychology and about insight are going to have to start confronting our more conventional uh, idioms and more conventional practices. And that means we're all up for confrontation. Political parties, no. Time to get out of the kumbaya groups. I'm sorry. Uh, I've got to find some other alternative, in my view, if you want the brain to grow, because bilateral thinking like that ain't good for anybody. We're more complex than political parties are. Political parties are trying to squeeze us into flag-moving movements, and I'm sorry. If anything's going to turn the millennials off, I think it's going to be the political party system. That's going to turn them off. So we are going to have to say, no, no, people are more complicated than this. So what would that mean practically? Well, it would mean that if somebody from labor and the conservatives but could sit together and agree on something and show a creative agreement, actually show how they work, thinking together, then younger people might say, well, well, now this is kind of unusual. They seem to be talking to each other in a creative and in a constructive way. But too often what they see are just people yelling at each other quietly. In England, you don't really yell. They scream at each other in America. Well, I'm sorry, I forgot Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, Parliament turns into a juvenile gang. You know, I mean, if you've not had the privilege of seeing a public school uh, ruckabout, you know, for 12-year-olds or 10-year-olds, you've got to go to Parliament. It's almost a way of proving that Plato and Aristotle were right, namely that a democratic process can turn into mob rule. You know, I mean, if you wanted to prove democracy wrong, show up on Tuesdays and see what they do there. Perfectly sane, intelligent, gifted men and women are acting like juvenile delinquents, baying for blood, yelling and screaming, jumping up and down with some idiot saying, order, 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 boom, boom, boom. Are we kidding? Are we kidding? We expect to have those axioms helping us deal with the likes of the conflicts proposed in the contemporary world internationally? Really? Really? I don't think we're going to make it if we simply rest upon the traditions of these fossilized um, assumptions, which are not helping us. So lastly, I want to point to something more positive. In the last decade, at least, there, there is evidence, both in business colleges, in non-governmental organizations, uh, that people are using the models developed by the Tavistock Clinic and by other group uh, relations um, organizations to bring individuals together who um, have very different traditions and to learn how to um, globalize democracy. In other words, how to create a global community that's not just a notion, but is a living reality, where the um, the fear of migrants, the fear of migration, because of course that's the, the one thing that you've got here in the UK and you've got in the USA, which is the fear of the Syrians or the fear of the Mexicans in America. It, the fear of migration is really a fear of invasion by ideas. It's the, it's the familiar, it's the fear of the invasion by the unfamiliar. Uh, and one, I'm not going to excoriate people who, who are apparent racists or apparent this or that. The fact is we have to understand where they're coming from. Uh, and to see if we can find some way to, tra to transform their more raw emotional states into something more understandable. So 
What I'm hoping we, as by we I mean the, a community like yourselves in Great Britain, close to the epicenter of that which changed group psychoanalysis around the world, can begin to see how you have to export the skills you've developed with some changes. I mean, I would want the, uh, a Winnicottian dimension put in to this picture that's not there in group relations training and so on. Time does not permit this for me to go into this now, I'm afraid. But I would want to see us developing skills so that individuals, young people, can go out and help organize, help be consultants to groups that are in conflict. I haven't seen the play Oslo, but I have read um, a, a lot of works on uh, Camp David Accords, the, the, the Dayton Accords, on peace negotiations in many different parts of the world. These negotiations are remarkable. They're wonderful. But what's sad, in my view, is they're one-offs. They're one-offs. Why? What is there about us? What is there about us? Coming to the third decade of the 21st century, that we are still psychologically living in the Middle Ages. Is it that we just love killing? Is that it? Maybe it's it. Why spoil the fun? Maybe we just want a kind of uh, wargasm. You know, we'll just all go up together between the idiot in North Korea and the one in the United States. We'll all just go up in one just fantastic, you know, <coughs> end of civilization, end of planet. You know? I'm not kidding. Wargasm is something I take as a serious prospect that somewhere is the ultimate orgasmic moment uh, you know you know it would you know Stalin would just kind of maybe come out of his grave and go wait a minute I'm going I don't want to miss this so I think if we 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 have to wonder what's stopping us what's preventing us from using psychoanalytical insights and insights from other Dimensions, analytical psychology, the Jungian concept of the shadow, very, very interesting idea, very interesting idea. Why are we not using what we know? And I don't mean just the psychoanalytical world, but I mean um, Western civilization. All right, on that happy note, I will stop, and we'll go wherever you want to go in the course of the discussion. I think that we're going to pass a mic around to individuals. and You're encouraged here to just say what you want to say. Probably take five, six, or seven sayings before I, I say anything, I guess. Thanks very much, Christopher. I, I thought that was very interesting. I often wonder whether there are two systems fighting each other that there's an economic system that means everything has got to go up and up and up, and it's a real defense against loss. Um, you know, and on the other side, you know, and so people get very frightened. They can't let go. And like ideas, then they can't integrate anything. So the more we have, the more fear of loss there mm. is. And so the more advanced societies become the more they have. Again, that defense against loss can, can mount. But, uh, you know, these two systems may need a way of speaking to each other. Anyway. Hello. You didn't uh, mention contemporary platforms like Facebook and the echo chamber. Um, when I... Um, try to ask, who should I vote for? I don't know. Um, only a specific group of friends um, answered me. Um, I had no one from the third party from the popular party at, the, at that time, and that was very confusing, but I realised that's because of the echo chamber of being only put in a position where you're talking to your friends online. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the way people talk to each other in groups having changed radically because of social media. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, my problem with it is um, the, your lack of definition of democracy. There have been so many, a number of different concepts of democracy. The Greeks used the term, but they meant d democracy only for the free men, not for the slaves. Um, now, today we mean by democracy putting a cross once every five years against someone who will misrepresent you, by and large, apart from Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> um, I want to go back to the Russian Revolution and the Soviets that to me that lasted only 18 months before they were destroyed by the Civil War and the West but the Soviets I think represented the highest form of democracy that we've seen in the modern world ordinary working people taking decisions, elected from the factories and the working class communities. We've not seen anything like that, and it wasn't allowed to survive. It was too much of a threat to the rest of the capitalist world. But you see, a lot of those workers who formed the Soviets had taken part in anti-Semitic pogroms, for example. And something happened to those people. Once they identified the real enemy, not the, who were not the Jews, but the Tsarist system, the, the Russian, the nobility, the capitalist class, these were the real enemies who had been oppressing the people. Once those workers and peasants were able to identify the real enemies, they didn't need to oppress the Jews. So what happened to them? I think they embraced, they discovered, they created a new form of internal democracy, which was then reflected in the external democracy of the Soviet system. I just wonder whether that makes sense and whether do you have any comments on that? Hello, um, this is Roy Kutan in the sort of uh, Lenin Institute. Um, I'm very concerned about the left wing. Uh, uh, Mr. Wallace, you, you don't make any secret of your left uh, leaning uh, sympathies, you know, Marx, God, uh, you said. Uh, Th uh, thank you. Uh, this thing about the migrants uh, being, uh, you, you, you like a lot of psychologists, you psychologize everything, you know, you sort of, uh, it's, it's a way of control, isn't it? It's a magic uh, thing. Uh, migrants, uh, there may be something about lowering wages, um, uh, they vote for the Democrats, so that, that's where they're brought in, uh, they take resources. Um, and I don't think in America they're worried about immigrants, they're worried about illegal immigrants. Uh, people who don't respect their laws and uh, get all the advantages. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Would you, uh, you will you let the gentleman there with his... Uh, his uh, we can't um, hear you. The microphone is too close to your mouth. You just okay, okay, fine. Uh, I'm not you. used to microphones. I'm sorry. But, um, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about this, um, you know, your globalization. I mean, it uh, seems to me, that, uh, whether you comment on this, is the two main movements in modern politics now in society are... If you like nationalism, globalism, the individual, the state. What worries me about your, uh, your ideas about the group uh, and the idea that uh, you know, the group reflects everything, which I, which I don't accept. Um, I mean, both fascism and uh, communism were collectivist ideologies. Um, and why have you got this sort of faith in the, the collective identity, which you seem to have? Um, and, you know, this rather, um, I don't wish to be offensive, but I think, I think you're slightly patronizing, you know, that um, the thing in Parliament, of course, it's not juvenile, it's, it's, you could see it as gladiatorial. Um, it's one set of people fighting for their view of reality versus another set of people fighting for their view of reality. And, of course, it's going to be gladiatorial and, and unpleasant and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's a healthy thing. It's not particularly juvenile. And all the sitting around and, uh, you, you know, you talk about Kumbaya, uh, and then there seems to be a contradiction. You say we, we need time for confrontation. Um, there seems to be a conflict between, between confrontation and sitting around and we're all, um, you know, we're all equal and so on and so on. We're not all equal. Uh, we're equal in the eyes of God, perhaps. And you go on about the, you make a reference to the, uh, the noble savage, don't you? Primitive societies where men and women were equal. I mean, where your evidence of that comes from. Um, so there's a lot, a lot your, your worldview, your, your mindset, I, I just don't, I don't get. 
uh, at all. Clearly. Uh, um, it, it just is completely foreign to me. But it's a mindset I've come across uh, a lot of times, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's a mindset, I think, what uh, happened in the United States, that was a challenge, you know, people screaming, um, you know, women going down on the pavement screaming no. Um, the Democrats in this paranoid thing about Russia, it's a paranoid delusion, collusion, because they can't face a new reality. Um, and perhaps we ought to start facing that reality. Well, um, let me um, uh, respond to some of the things that have been said. First, um, it, the democratic process that I'm describing, although I didn't take us back to Plato and Aristotle and go through that, there is a time problem with something like that. Um, I hope I conveyed that the, there are rules, there, the, the right of assembly, the right of free speech. These are terribly important rules that govern uh, and sustain a democracy. So for a democratic process to exist, it has to be secure. So there is the right of the free male citizen in, in Athens to, to speak. Then, and uh, of course, many people are excluded. We can go through differing governments all over the world uh, that have had democracies. And as Fukuyama points out, there have been an exponential growth in democracies in the last 40 years, far in excess of previous era. So to some extent, I think it's, over, it's 60% of the world's countries, of the governments in the world, declare themselves to be democracies. They're very different from one another. So there is no one single democracy or model of a democracy when it comes to government. What I'm trying to do here is to take the idea that, the, that democracy is unknowingly, in the, early, in the, in the Greek sense, um, an attempt to deal with the collective mind, with the mind as a collective. How do you deal with people who are thinking differently with one another? Uh, what do you do with them? The fear here is that if you let people be equal with one another, and of course that is the theory of democracy, each person has, is the same as anyone else, then uh, you're at the risk of a majority rule which will follow the wrong feelings. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it was the theory of democracy because I would argue there is no such thing as the theory of just about anything. I would say it is a theory of democracy that I'm speaking about. You have a different theory, perhaps, of democracy, but it is not the theory. I would be concerned should anyone here think that he or she has the truth about anything. Uh, it is a model of relativism in the sense that uh, we, all, we are all, in a sense, related to one another, and we can't dictate the terms. So we live in a relational situation. No one person here, in my view, is well guided if he or she says, this is the truth. And if you don't like it, you haven't understood the truth. So yes, it's relativistic. We are all in relation to one another. Quite right. So let's see if we can overcome and see if, if people are, are, can you still think? Yeah? OK, if you can still think, then uh, rise up and speak. Yes, in the back. We will get you a mic. So I was just thinking about politics and leadership and um, how groups operate, because I think the model that you've talked about from the Tavistock, there are no leaders as such. The, the, the person who is, who's the group facilitator is guiding and interpreting, but they don't lead. The group leads itself. And this sort of democratic spirit, if you like, I think works very well in small groups. And it's quite interesting if you just think about what's happening in the room this evening. 
there are lots of us who agree with each other and some of us who don't. And the dynamic that sets up around that is, I think, very interesting. And what you tend to get with that sort of a dynamic is a polarisation where you have two leaders or a number of leaders and people will associate themselves with groups around that. And that is, I think, how party politics develops. So my question is, how do you get beyond that dynamic? I mean, maybe in a sense you've answered that to an extent because you've said that this model, the kind of the Tavistock model, is one way of overcoming that dynamic. And I, and I do ag agree to an extent, but I think when you start dealing with larger groups, you get, you get a sort of a spirit that overtakes that. So my question is, is how do we get beyond that? Well, let me, let me respond to that rather than waiting for the next... Uh, my argument here is for a change in um, political structures uh, towards a political psychology. What do I mean by that? I mean um, groups, small groups, 8, 12, 15 people. Just to take a contemporary example, let's just say six people who are pro-exit and six who are pro-remain. Six people who are Trump supporters, six who are not. And I would think that what we need are for people who see themselves as diametrically opposed to one another, meeting with a consultant over a long period of time to break down those radical polarizations so they can see one another in themselves. They can see where they are the same. They can see what the dynamics are, what the psychodynamics are of powerful states of mind. Uh, in 2015 and 16, I spent about half the year in Baldwin Hills, Los Angeles, which is 98% African American. There were no white people within several miles of where I lived. The rest of the year, I lived on the prairie in North Dakota, which is all farmers, Nor uh, Swedes, Norwegians, Danes, Germans. These were two completely different worlds. Uh, in those two different worlds, I understood very different views of reality, very different views. I'm convinced that if I could have brought five people from Baldwin Hills and five people from North Dakota together in the same room, and they just sat together and talked to each other over time, they would begin to understand one another. That is the history of psychoanalysis. It is the breaking down of fixed positions, of paranoid states of mind. Issues become more complex. Human, be human beings become findable, uh, and people identify with each other. And then the, po the, the, the rancorous politics of labeling people as racist or as left-wing this or this or that, that starts to break down, starts to go away. Um, so I think that however essential identity politics was in the 1960s, the 1970s, and 1980s, um, that, and I do think it was, unfortunately now we, that will come back to haunt us if we don't find some way to um, uh, connect with people from other points of view. And certainly in my travels from, because I would drive from uh, Los Angeles to North Dakota through... Nevada, Utah, uh, <laughs> Idaho, Montana, and then to Dakota. It's, a, it's an interesting transition. It takes, well, I would take five or six days to do it, because I'd go into a local cave somewhere, and it's not long before you meet the locals, and they tell you what they think. And so one goes from the Pacific Coast vision of reality to uh, the Nevadan thinking to the Rocky Mountain thinking, and then you get to the Great Plains. By this point, this transition is a political education. I mean, you have really gone through mm. an extraordinary transition. Mm. What I came to appreciate was that the farmers of North Dakota, it's a farming community, live in the Trump culture of, um, I hear that, or I've heard that, you remember Trump in the beginning, his alt facts, I've heard this or I've heard that. People were saying, where did you hear this? Where did you get your information? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that's oral cultural tradition. That's the way people talk 
in oral culture. They don't read papers. They don't read books. What they trust is what they've heard from their neighbors. So the reason why they listen to talk radio, Rush Limbaugh and all these right-wing folks, is because they're being yelled at by these passionate voices. I think they yell, Limbaugh yells, because these chaps are driving tractors and semis, and they couldn't <laughs> hear anything unless somebody was screaming at them. Uh, so, um, but they trust what they hear from each other. So oral traditions are, they're rural, these are rural cultures. The rural tradition of thinking in North America is completely different from the coastal way of thinking. C completely different. It's also faith-based. Think about it. I mean, if you're a devout Christian um, and your faith guides you in your convictions, your actions, in your relations, you're not going to let the New York Times tell you what to do or CNN. It's your faith. So the defiance of so-called facts, the demand, the, the, the fact that, well, I've heard that and so-and-so says this, these are affectional communities. They're communities based upon affectionate relationships between one another. And you have to know what the rural world is like in North America to understand why this is the way they think. Um, you can disparage it. You can mock them. And certainly they have been the object of remarkable mockery. But if you look at when CNN or MSNBC or many of the mainstream media uh, stations cover, they're always in Atlanta, New York, or Los Angeles. They don't hang out in Minneapolis. You don't see them in, uh, in uh, Iowa, except during elections. The whole of the rest of the country is ignored. Now, you simply can't expect a democracy to work if you decide you're not going to include half of the electorate in the process. I mean, doesn't that make sense? I mean, really, they feel left out because they have been left out. And they're mocked. And one can easily mock them. You know, um... Yes? Well, I think you should moderate, be a consultant for... A, I think you should moderate, be a consultant for a, a group exactly like that. And I think you need to persuade a TV producer friend of yours to get it on the BBC, because I'm sure... Or maybe Netflix or Amazon. I think you've got something going there. Well, that's kind of you. <laughs> well, I was thinking when you were talking just then that the only person who could bring that group together of the North Dakotans and the Californians is you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Or in other words, I'm worried that there's a kind of idealization of the potential of the group. And it's as if, as I'm listening to you, it's as if something rather remarkable is happening, which is it's as if your concept of free association and unconscious communication... <coughs> You're trying to raise it a level and lift it up and make it the basis on which politics organizes itself. And I'm very struck listening to you. Uh, I think it's a wonderful idea, by the way. It's, in, it's inspirational in the deeper sense. But I'm then thinking of beyond on the basic assumption group and the psychosis of the group. And I'm also thinking about is democracy about the freedom of people to communicate, or doesn't it fossilize into hegemonic thinking, into precisely group speak? And then I'm thinking, I'd love, I'd love the television program that this lady just said you should produce or direct or star in, or all three. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm just thinking there's something... There are moments where you really have to take sides... So in relationship to the Neelers and Trump, I'm assuming, perhaps wrongly, that we all know whose side we're on, right? The Neelers who are politically protesting and will not stand up for the anthem because so many black guys are being murdered by the police. Or the first, the first piece of legislation almost that Trump passed, the gagging order, all those men standing there, that any organization in the world giving abortion advice let alone providing abortions, was going to lose all its funds. Thousands and thousands of women are going to die 
because of this. You know this. You don't need me to tell you this. Mm. So I'm just saying, I think one sometimes has to be militant and take sides. Oh, I think so. And also, the group is crazier than maybe we want it to be. I oh, don't know. I, I think it's a wonderful point you're making, Jacqueline. And I, I think to uh, be clear here, because... Um, uh, the, my presentation can make this seem rather anodyne and sort of hegemonous, you know. I'm expecting uh, these groups, the people in the groups, to be at war with each other ideationally. I'm expecting very powerful emotions to be passed back and forth. What I think that is curative, therapeutic, is the process. The container, to use beyond, contains highly divergent um, people. Uh, so I would expect there to be war going on in the rooms between people. Um, and so, and, and it never will stop. It never stops. All you have to do is to bring in an immigrant. I mean, the psychology of the migrant, or the anti-immigration psychology, is not just about Syrians or Mexicans. It's about anybody who comes from the outside world that we don't know, doesn't look like us, and is the unknown, is therefore going to be the object of phenomenal projective identifications, and it never stops. But we think it's going to stop. So um, I think the, a problem with the program uh, that, that uh, y y was proposed about the BBC would be, well, first of all, it would be reality TV in a way, which would be pretty bloody awful. Um, but, but it would have to go on for years. Yeah. It would have to go on for years to show, and I'm, I'm an old man, you see. Uh, uh, and uh, I, th I think it would have to go on for years. But I, am, I do take uh, heart from uh, people in their 20s because I do think there is a new generation of people who are thinking differently from the um, older generations. I do think there's less tolerance within, this is an ironic moment, there's less tolerance for intolerance. They, they really do want a more inclusive world. Um, so I think that if we can um, uh, evolve more, I, and again, I don't, I don't have an answer, a solution or to the question, why psychophobia? Why have we evolved in the sciences and elsewhere? But psychoanalysis? No, it sort of stopped dead in its tracks. It's one of the reasons we worship beyond Winnicott and Lacan. It kind of ended with them. You know, that's why they've turned into gods. You know, and we just have to mention the words and we kneel. That's not thinking. That's worship. So uh, I, I, I think we, all of us, have to recognize there is a phobic attitude towards the life of the mind. I mean, Stephen Gross's book... Uh, uh, that he was published in the United States, sold a phenomenal number of copies. I don't know how many copies, Stephen, your book sold in America. Can you tell me off the bat? What it, how many? Millions. Yeah, a lot. Now, but, but, but think about this. It was one of the most popular books published in the United States in the last 10 years. It went everywhere. Everyone read it. It's deeply psychoanalytic. Deeply psychoanalytic. Do people really want to talk about it? Does it lead to a reinterest in psychoanalysis? No. Well, I'm glad you do think it does. I mean, I'm sure we do think in a way that it does. But what's interesting is it's almost kind of like um, literature on the sly. You kind of read this. What are you reading? Uh, 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 it's a book by. Oh, is that gross you're reading? Oh, right. It's sort of like it's almost it's almost kind of like a Lady Chatterley's Lover, or uh, something. Like, it's like oh no, really? Are you reading that? Uh, but look, if you look at um, uh, Stephen Gross's work, if you look at Adam Phillips's work, if you look at Josh Cohen's work, if you look at these people, Jacqueline Rose's work, you're looking at psychoanalytical writings which are widely disseminated in a world which is psychophobic. Now this just kind of like, wait a minute. So a reason why I'm speaking here about politics tonight in some ways, because I know some of you are in politics, and I'm very grateful for your coming this evening, is I really think there has to be a change in 
social culture. I think we have to develop a political psychology. I think psychoanalysts have done an awful lot, but we can't do this by ourselves. Either people in politics say, you know what, not only do I know a psychoanalyst, I work with one. What? Did, did, did you say you worked with one? In other words, there's even a shame in mentioning in government or NGOs or businesses that people have worked with psychoanalysts. The Pope is a cool dude. <laughs> no, he really is. He's a cool guy. He's, you know, and, and he, has a, he has a conscience. So, but I, I think that we, but uh, I'm not saying, I don't want to be in the ironic position of, being, of, being, of shaming us into something. I really want to try to raise this to the level of wondering, well, what is it? What are the unconscious reasons for the fact that we're still refusing to think psychologically? Why? Uh, I, I mean, I've said, well, maybe it's to license ourselves to murder and kill because we enjoy it. Um, uh, and I, I mean, there are Freudian explanations for this, but the, I mean, the urge here is to get people to feel that they can talk about the psychoanalysts they've worked with in government, uh, in, uh, in NGOs and business communities and so on. Uh, no, we don't have the ability to CAT scan your brains. No, we can't see right into you, which you know, a lot of people think. They still think we could read your mind. No, there are a lot of very strange fears and anxieties about coming into contact with a psychoanalyst. You know, it's almost like we're spooky. But I don't think it's that we're spooky. I think there's a fear of the mind. And therefore, the interest in the mind that was there in the early 20th century, extraordinary amount of interest in the mind, uh, is waning. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was interested in your comment about uh, politics being stuck in a sort of an adolescent state mm. of mind. And the thought I had was that I wonder if what we're craving, in a, in a sense, is a better definition, a better picture of what adulthood is. We spend a lot of time thinking about childhood, and I wonder if what's missing is something about a really good picture about well, what it means to be an adult. It's a very interesting point because, of course, the people we're talking about in Parliament and elsewhere are adults. So the question is, well, why can't they behave like that way in the theater of politics? I mean, off-piste, of course they behave like adults. Of course they get along with each other. Of course they reason with each other. But why in the theater do they behave differently? Why is it that, for example, in international relations, so-called, nations which have committed crimes against each other cannot apologize. What is there about leaders in one country that have, who have committed horrifying acts against another country over a long period of time? Why can't those leaders say, you know, looking back over our history in relation to your country, we have committed grave crimes against your civilization, against your people, for which we're deeply sorry. Now, why not? Because otherwise, what we're sustaining is an international relations predicated on sociopathic assumptions. There is no guilt. There is no reparation. And if you have no guilt and no reparation, and everyone is somehow in the right and everyone else is in the wrong, and you can just invade a country and then leave, what does that, what hope is there going to be for improved human relations on the international level. I mean, sure, the North Koreans are slightly bonkers now, but we nearly annihilated them and, and took them back to the, to, the, to the Bronze Age. We destroyed their country. Uh, and so after the invasion of Iraq, uh, the youngsters said, well, wait a minute, uh, we're next. And the North, Amer North Americans... The United, politics of the United States is the politics of invasion. Regime change, you remember that? I mean, it's regime change. Well, were I an Iranian? 
senior Iranian politician, North Korean, anyone else in, in, who, was not, who was on the American shit list, I would be concerned about being invaded. Yeah. So if, if we can find some way to uh, start to admit our wrongdoings, simple act of saying I'm sorry is uh, profoundly healing. Mm -hmm. but, but this is not politically acceptable. I know Bill Clinton tried it in Africa and elsewhere, and other politicians have tried it, sort of. And, they're, and I, I don't, was it, yeah, Obama went to Hiroshima uh, and gave a very carefully nuanced speech there. But um, we, need, we need to just go further than this. But in order, I think, for us to do it, we have to engage in the West, in the political dialogues, psychological political dialogues in which we ask, why are we arrested here? Why can't we move forward? Thank you. Um, firstly, I'm pleased to say that psychology is the third most popular A-level this term. Yay, so the young people are going. But I'm speaking as someone who tries to uh, facilitate a... Um, a pluralist group. A, I'm the chair of the Council for Psychoanalysis and Jungian Analysis. Mm. And in doing so, we have 27 different training um, organisations that can never agree. And in fact, we have wonderful discussions about how to be pluralistic, and we don't agree on that. <laughs> and we have these wonderful debates, and we, yeah, we work out that, yes, there's a difference of opinion. But then we try and write it down. And then we try and we make, take minutes and we try and convey the spirit of our conversations. And it's that process that I think is where we fail. We then simplify it. It's about having a television program that goes on for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. It's how we get that spirit of conversation and discussion and non-echo chambering as a message. I wonder if your thoughts on that. <coughs> I think it's, it's hard to bear this. It's hard to bear this. Uh, and um, one has to live with, uh, with failure, with a lot of failure. Um, so when I say that the therapeutic process is in the democratic process, it's the process that's therapeutic. I, I don't mean that the individuals within that process will in and of themselves feel cured by it. They're not going to feel bettered by it. They may feel sickened by it. They may feel distressed by it. They're certainly going to feel depressed by it. But we have to bear the depression. We just have to. Uh, so there's no, no light at the end of this tunnel for any one of us alone. There's no uh, radiant moment. There's no point of arrival. This really is a task that we have to embark upon for the rest of our lives, in my view, for future generations, with no, quote-unquote, hope at the end of this for an arrival point, because there never will be an arrival point. There never will. Anti-Semitism will be here for centuries, probably. The uh, uh, sexism, the, the hatred of women children and others will be here uh, as long as human beings are walking the face of this earth. We have to live with some pretty horrible sides to ourselves. Uh, I'm not going to humiliate myself on the stage here by dis any more than I already have, but I mean uh, by discussing my own prejudices, which are disturbing. Because when I find myself with a, a racist thought or a sexist thought, it's shocking. But, you know, there it is. Uh, and so, but I do think if we can bear to be in the same room together and keep on going and provide a model for group relations for our children and the next generations, we will improve where we are now. Because right now, we're splitting apart. We're just splitting off. We're attacking each other, we're labeling each other, we're vilifying each other, we're coming up with sign systems 
Uh, so even a, a, an important political point that Jacqueline was making about different votes are being used as sign systems, as iconic moments of something bad that happened here or something that's bad that happened there. It's not like that's not true, but they're not signifiers, they're signs. So we're, we're, we're carrying verbal placards as well as actual ones. Uh, so uh, how else are we going to go forward if we don't go forward uh, within the democratic process? What other model can we turn to? So time for us to get off our high horses. And I admit to being on a high horse. I mean, I've been on one a fair number of times. <laughs> uh, I admit it. I mean, uh, yeah. But we have to bear being worsened by this. I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of farm families invited me over for dinner um, last, yeah, last year. Um, I've known them for 20 years. Um, there were about 15 of them. It was a little unusual. I didn't quite know why they'd assembled. And after 10 minutes, I realized why. They were going, they took me through all their racist thinkings. It started with the Lakota Sioux Indians that I, that, that are, that are, they're 10 miles from where we live. So we started out, I started with listening to their views about the Lakota Sioux. And I'm not going to take it through all of the different um, things they said about Hillary Clinton. I mean, every conceivable prejudice in the world was there. It was there. And um, I, I, the moment when I sort of lost it um, and, and, and got on my high horse of sorts was when they said, well, you know, the queen had Diana murdered. And I said, don't give me that shit. I mean, that is really, that's too far. As if everything else was fine. <laughs> And, you know, and I, I felt irate, and I could, you know, et cetera. Now, was I, um, if, I this, this, if this had been on the BBC, I mean, there was, you see, he's just exactly like the rest of them. You know, he descends into the pit, and, you know, and, and well, yes. Do, am I, would I do that if I weren't delegated as a group consultant? Yes, I would. Sure. That's what we all have to go through. So we're, we'll find ourselves to be lesser beings than we may have thought we were, because we are. We are lesser beings than we think we are, all of us. Uh, and uh, the architecture of grandiosity in uh, the evolution of Western cultures, especially amongst the educated individuals, is kind of mind-boggling. I mean, meritorious culture, come on. We're constantly putting badges of uh, respectability on one another's lapels. and. Um, leaving the rest of the world behind. Uh, so to move... Okay. Um, uh, to move back from a sort of your more Whitman-esque um, expansion back into a room... Um, uh, earlier on, you talked about six people and six people, and that brought to mind my experience of being on a jury. So from um, mm. Dakota, we're into Southwark Crown Court, where 12 people, randomly chosen from those who couldn't come up with a better business excuse not to be there, unemployed, uh, uh, somebody who could speak only Russian, so I don't know how that happened... Um, as, as people might know, I'm not actually meant to disclose the deliberations in the jury room, but even though I'm a lawyer, I'm about to do so. And um, as, a, as an experience of process, it was the most fascinating thing. And uh, various people are nodding, and I think they may have had the same experiences, where 12 people with nothing in common other than their cards came up and a jury clerk chose them out of a a big pool, are in a room, they've listened to the same few days of evidence and they're there with a door shut uh, with no consultant or third, third party facilitator to see where they get to and they're basically not allowed out until they've convinced each other. And um, 
the uh, I mean, I could tell the story of how we came to a, a unanimous verdict, and it was the most extraordinary process. And I think if there's a way of, you know, to hell with select committees and televisation, you know, put 12 people in a room and say they're not coming out until they've agreed on a bill and, and see, see what happens, because it was, um, it was incredibly heartening at the possibility of minds being changed. I think that's such an incredibly important point, and it's why I think that when the Greeks picked up the theory of democracy as a theory of government, it was predicated upon uh, the way we are, the way we think, because uh, we are all Democrats in our internal world. Democracy is indigenous to the humans, to Homo sapiens. So utter strangers who have nothing in common, forced to be together, can do something that they're not trained in doing. Why? Because it's who we are. It is the way our minds work. Uh, when I would make interpretations about parts of the personality in, uh, you know, with ordinary analysts in the 1970s and 80s, I would often use the example of Parliament or Congress as uh, uh, to, to, through the metaphor, help individuals who were distressed by by parts of, their, of themselves they didn't want to discuss. They say, well, there's one part of you that comes from this party of views, and there's another part of you that thinks this way. That metaphor helped them enormously. And I can recall with one um, North American patient um, in those days, going back to the 1980s, it was enough for an American to say, well, I feel this way. And that was the end of the discussion. All that had to be said was, this is the way I feel. That means no more thinking. So. That having been said to me in the session, I sort of gulped and I said, but um, my understanding is you're saying to me that having said this is how you feel, I can't speak anymore. Is that about right? And yes, because this is how I feel. I've told you how I feel. Right, so now I have to stop speaking, she said. Well, well if this is the way I feel, yes. I said, you know, I have a problem with that because um, I feel I'm being told how to think and what I can say in this room. I may be wrong, but I feel that's what you're saying. To well, it is. Well, um, why should I give in to the Saddam Hussein part of your personality? Now, to her credit, and it's to the credit, I think, of the fact that, that she is a Democrat. She has a Democratic mind. She, she understood this and burst into tears. And she didn't stop crying for the rest of the session. And it's simply that that one interpretation allowed her to, to have access to something in her preconceptual unconscious, realized in that one moment. And it changed our work together. From that moment on, I could talk with her about an imperious, destructive part of her personality that had managed to destroy so many of her relationships in life, both external and internal. You see, um, so uh, the 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 British view of object relations of the internal world is a theory of democracy, and the Greek implementation of it into a theory of government is, in my view, an externalization of what we know about ourselves as in psychological terms. Therefore, the democratic process is, from my point of view, a quintessentially therapeutic process. It's how we live with, deal with, bear, and attempt to transform the human mind. And, you know, when we go to the grave, we're unfinished works. We're still works in progress. Wait a minute, I haven't finished. I'm sorry, your time's up. But wait a minute. No, it's up. So we're all going to go six feet under uh, with, as incomplete works. Well, OK. So our civilizations will as well. But we can pass on. We can pass on, like rather Marcus Aurelius, who lived on in his laws, a structure of Aurelian law, lived on for centuries after his death. So you can see 
Marcus Aurelius's thinking in Roman law. That's Aurelian. So I think that we can pass on new axioms, but we are going to have to include psychology in our thinking and, and try to confront our psychophobia, because that's, to my way of viewing this, the most difficult thing we, we face. Uh, at the very back, did you want to say? Yes. No? Um, I was struck by um, two phrases that you used in your talk and that have echoed in the discussion. And the first was, we have to grow up. And the second was, we in the West. And for me, they seem to pull against um, the ideas that you've been speaking of because um, we have to grow up seems to suggest some sort of fantasy of adulthood, some sort of place where we've left childhood or adolescence behind. And um, I'm concerned because sometimes a lot of what is sanctioned as, um, as violent or sanctioned as um, something that doesn't listen to what's being said happens in the name of adulthood, in the name of um, a superior adult position. I mean, um, if you can think back to being a child, then adults can be tyrants. So I'm just a little concerned that um, growing, up, growing up to be an adult is being held out as um, something that we have to do in order to be democratic. And um, also, if, if, it's, if it's important to listen in order to be democratic, then what is, what is this, um, this we in this West? I mean, where is it? Is it still even possible to think of um, us in the West? And where where does it where does it stop and what what sorts of resources can we claim for ourselves if we speak in the name of um, this we in the west and and a third concern is just that um, you spoke of people in their twenties and that 's where I still am and in most of my years i 've seen democracy somehow. Um, being imposed on, on people added to an idea of civilization that has to be sent out from, from this West. So um, I'm also a little concerned about what, what we sanction ourselves, what we allow ourselves to do when we think that we're speaking in the name of, um, of democracy and just be interested to hear what you have what you think about this? Well, to take your last point first, I mean, there are democracies all over the world, um, uh, all over the world, and there have been for thousands of years. So unfortunately, time and, and the remit of this talk this evening was not to trace the history and the dissemination of democracies throughout the globe, but by no means does it start within Athens. And um, we see, for example, in the Arab Spring that people were saying, well, you cannot impose democracy uh, in these regions. They've never experienced it before. My argument is, yes, they have. It's inside their internal worlds. People know what democracy is no matter, no matter where they are. So the concept that you cannot export democracy to North Africa or elsewhere, other countries, because they have no tradition of it, might be politically correct. That might be actually true insofar as the prospect of developing democratic institutions or democratic forms of government, yes, no doubt. But to say these people have no idea of what democracy is is like saying they have no mind. And now I don't agree. They do have a mind. They do have mental life. Insofar as your point about adulthood, uh, I'm sorry, it was a metaphor. It wasn't meant literally. I, I know that people are actually adults. They've grown up and they look like they're, you know, they might be six foot two and 45, so one would say they're adults. I meant a frame of mind, not a, not a literal accomplishment. Um, but what do I mean by be adult? I mean being thoughtful, not impulsive like children. Uh, and I certainly didn't mean to inadvertently disparage children. There's some extremely bright, gifted children uh, who don't engage in juvenile delinquent behavior. My point really was 
in the theaters of democracy, whether it's the parliament on Tuesdays, whether it's other countries, I don't think that these are good models for thoughtfulness. So I use the concept of adult in that context. In other words, not uh, as a universal theory of, a, of what an adult is or adult life. Uh, in the United States, they talk about going, reaching across the aisle. Heard of that metaphor? I mean, the Republicans and the Democrats don't have much to do with each other. They should reach across the aisle more often than not. There's a problem with that. If you've been to the Congress uh, and looked and been there and sat in the room, there's nobody there. You can't reach across the aisle because there's no one to reach to. So the democracies in the United States, is a, is, it's absent. They've, va they've vacated the building, except when they come there to vote. Um, now, they are there in committees, rather like here in the House of Commons. They, are, they have com you know, House committees of Commons. That are, but at least in Parliament, every Tuesday, they get in the same room together, and they have debate. They talk to each other. You do not have that kind of paradigm in the United States government, in the, in the, in the democracy there. I am getting a little bit off course here, because I really didn't intend to discuss government. I was really trying to talk about the democratic mind and how the Greek theory um, uh, arrives out of that. But I think that we, there, are many, many, uh, there are many arguments for the fact that the Sumerians, 2500 BC, Gilgamesh, they think, was in a sense a Democrat. Uh, there are, there, there, there is great interest in tracing the history of, de of democracy in many countries going way, way back. Before they theorized it, they were practicing it. So if you're practicing something without having theorized it, where is that coming from? I think it's coming from human nature. It's coming from who we are. We have minds. They have contents in them. We, have, we are in conflict with ourselves, which for some people is a bummer. For Freud, it was the axis of the concept of symptom formation, which was another form of communication, i.e., in a way, a symptom was a, a wonderful form of art. It was psychological art. It allowed a, a, a powerful set of conflicts to be constellated into something very mysterious but memorable, which the individual could take to the psychoanalysis. I have no idea why I'm suffering from this. What the heck is it? Freud said, well, it's kind of like a dream. In fact, it's exactly like a dream. Let, what are your associations? So um, what Freud saw was how conflict is generative. It's almost like he's saying, thank God you've got a mind. Uh, a troubled one, but a troubled one is informed. It's informed. And rather like Stephen Gross's book, it's like, you know, if you're going to look into yourself, if you're going to examine what's going on, you're going to learn a lot. And uh, I, I think what's wonderful about being a psychoanalyst is how people who know nothing about it and who yet venture into that room one way or the other is how they take to it. I mean, it's rather like they've always been there. They know what it is. Well, that's not because of psychoanalysis. That's because it's in us. We have a need for it. We need to, to push on, and um, we can easily be persecuted as psychoanalysts because we're not so popular right now, but I, as, my, as you, under, I'm sure, this is now a tedious point I'm making this evening. We psychoanalysts are living in an era in which the, at least the Western world, I'm sorry, I can't speak beyond that, but the Western world hates thinking. We're not thinking anymore. Uh, I beg your pardon? Oh, yes. No, I, I think that... I beg your pardon? I think that when the... I think the shattering events of the Second War, of the First Second War of the Holocaust, uh, 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 of the atomic bomb, uh, destroyed our uh, our assumptions. We were no longer able to believe in ourselves or search for meaning. So we, I think we turned towards more materialist assumptions. You then move a little bit further into the, um, and by the way, the postmodernists solved this problem of who were we and what do we mean by saying, well, well we, there never was a self anyway. You can throw that one out. So that gets sort of pushed to the side. We then move into the 21st century with the IT revolution, etc. And everyone now thinks that the meaning of life is to be part of a transmissive culture. So we're transmissive selves, we're, tra we're transmitters amongst all the other transmitters, and we're identified with, with uh, the, the IT world. 
So we're not thinking anymore, and actually thinking is now considered to be an unfortunate a form of inefficiency. The thoughtful self is inefficient. Uh, one of the things Barack Obama was advised to, to do early on in 2008 in his campaign was, Barack, when somebody asks you a question, don't go, ah, uh, which is what he would do. He'd go, ah. Uh, he was thinking, ah. Uh, he was being thoughtful. The, the folks had to say, him, close your mouth and stop the ah. Uh. Yeah, Nikki. I don't know how many politicians there are in this room, but I am one of them. <laughs> and I, I, um, but and I wasn't going to say anything, but you just prompted me to really, which is, uh, is that it's very hard in politics to to show any kind of uncertainty, mm. and um, you know you're often in in a group where people really don't suffer from uncertainty. Um, and and I came into politics well from you know it was a convoluted route and it wasn't career didn't want to be a career politician at all um, but I I came originally from a background in academia where there was a tremendous premium on doubt mm -hmm. and I and then I went into a a lot of activity because you could see something happening and you could try and make something happening and you work with positive groups as long as there was enough positivity in the group. Too many people who were negative in the group didn't work so well. But anyway, there I ended up in politics. And I just wanted to say that some of the best political meetings I've been involved in have been the all-party meetings. Mm -hmm. And the all-party groups in Parliament which now extend right out to all sorts of individuals, really, I think, work pretty well. And maybe that speaks to something you've been saying. And I prefer these all-party discussions mm -hmm. where we're trying to get, you know, prob you know, not the lowest common denominator, but the highest common factor, if we can. Um, but I just wanted to say something to you about what you've been saying, which I found really fascinating and it's come out, I think, very well in the discussion there's been, and very, it's been very wide-ranging. But the point I wanted to make to you was that I think you've moved between all sorts of arenas where we can think in the way you're suggesting, be thoughtful, um, involve ourselves in a democratic process. But the role model you're holding up all the time is, and you keep saying you don't mean to talk about it, is government. Mm. And it's at the government level that you see the worst example, probably, of that from what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, isn't that the, is that the area that you really want to change? Gosh, what a wonderful question. And um, I agree that the all-party um, meetings are the most, are inspiring. Um, just as they are inspiring in the states when the Republicans and Democrats form a, uh, joint legislative activities together. Um, and this should be, more people should see this. Um, and I do think that in order for there to be the kind of change that I'm talking about, it can't happen without the political leadership being part of that process of change. Now, um, Odd characters or odd people are beginning to speak about group dynamics on the international stage. And we, that by we I mean politicians, leaders of nations, are going to have to find ways to talk about cause and effect. I mean, why is it that it was left up to Vladimir Putin to say, of all the world leaders, well, perhaps others did, but he was certainly the one who put it in ways that hit the print media, that the reason that the North Koreans were so freaked out by the Americans was because of the invasion of Iraq. Why did we leave it to Putin to declare the obvious? I mean, that's clear. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. I didn't really mean that metaphor. But you don't have to be that to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to make that link. Why are we not thinking psychologically? That is so clear. 
um, um, how many Americans know that we shot down an Iranian jumbo jet and all the passengers on that plane were killed? 385 people went down. How many Americans know that? I expect if you ask them, do you remember when a destroyer in the United States Navy shot down an Iranian commercial aircraft? We don't know that stuff anymore. We don't know what we're doing to each other. There's an attack on memory. There are attacks on linking. So when, uh, you know, I think if, a, I mean, if Putin wants to be the leader of me connecting certain dots and saying this is why this is happening, uh, why are the Iranians so, so uh, up in arms over the Americans? Why are they afraid of the North Americans? They have very good reason to be. So uh, it, it's not as if they're, it, it's a question of saints and sinners. But if we don't start to understand why we're afraid of each other and why we uh, take up arms against each other, verbally I mean, um, then we will take up literal arms against one another. And we don't have a heck of a lot of time anymore because although we've always been at war with each other, I mean, we've always been killing each other, actually now we can end the race. I mean, this, we're far more dangerous than we've ever been. That's the problem. We're just far more dangerous. So there's an urgency here to the, I think, the, the uh, psychoanalytical project, which I see as part of the democratic process, which is examine yourself. Examine yourself. So uh, you were talking about the BBC program. I and mean, one of the things, if it were an international group of people meeting, I would say, look, here's one of the rules we're going to do. If there's something about yourself or your country you don't like, talk about it. But rule number two is don't talk about what you don't like about somebody else's country. Talk about yourself. If, you, if there's something about your history, your country, etc., that you don't like, fair game. But leave the other ones alone. In other words, we have to start to change behavior. But because if we don't, we're just passively accepting ancient traditions that go back to the um, late Middle Ages of, of warfare. Warfare is what we, we turn to. It's what we turn to. Um. The idea that we're, that we're all in it together uh, has been a sort of ideological lie that was um, presented to, in this country, I don't know about the States, but um, the lie that uh, um, austerity was um, necessary because we're all suffering in the same way. And I wonder whether you're contributing to that um, ideological sort of push in um, sort of uh, masking over, I mean, you mentioned Marx at the beginning, masking over structural, um, structural antagonisms that aren't just um, ideational, but are mm. you know, real world and um, irreconcilable. I mean, uh, the gentleman over here, I think, represents um, a, a point of view and a worldview that is completely sort of opposed to mine. Uh, and, that we, and there might be all kinds of psych psychological reasons that, uh, between us, but ultimately, however long we sit in a room together and talk about them and learn about ourselves from that, ultimately there is an irreconcilable antagonism between us, uh, which is a class one. Yep. Um, so I, I wondered what you thought. It's a good point. No, there are irreconcilable differences. No, I mean, there are irreconcilable differences. And there are factors involved in conflict between individuals that that have entirely to do with economic discrepancies or economic histories. This is not just psychological. There are real differences here. There is real oppression. There are people who are really excluded. This is not just a psychological state of mind. The point is, in a democracy, all participants in it have to meet in the room and discuss the very thing you've just brought up. In other words, uh, if there were someone in that room with you, and you know that person to be, uh, let's call it one of the, the part of the one percent, 
who is uh, engaging in oppressive business activity somewhere in the world, and you know it, and you say, look, I'm sorry I'm calling you out. What you're doing to workers in, Qat in Qatar, et cetera, to create this and that and the other thing, it's immoral. It's, it's unethical. People are dying. You're killing people. You absolutely should say that. The point I'm bringing about here is that if that person agrees to stay in the room with you, and I hope that person would, over time, I would hope that that individual could be changed by you. I'm not going to give up on that. Because if we give up on that, then it's over with. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not a faith-based person. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not like that. I don't believe in that sort of thing. But I do believe in the power of rhetoric and also the fact that we are all the same. So I think you can talk to somebody that you think is an outright sociopath and you'll never get through to him. And then all of a sudden you break him down or break her down or she breaks you down or whatever and you get through. Um, you're an eloquent chap. You're strong. Um, you'll speak with passion if you're in a group. Why, why not believe in yourself? Why not believe in the capacity to get through? Um, what I do in North Dakota, uh, where I lose most of the discussions, is I'm prepared to be destroyed. I'm in the Winnicottian sense of the term, in its concept of the use of the object. Not in his theory of relating, but his theory of the use of the object, which I think is incredibly important. You have to be prepared to be destroyed. So, I mean, I don't know that on many occasions my political favorites have ever gotten into office. Uh, and Arsenal's really going downhill. So I'm in, uh, you know, uh, Man City. Man City is doing extremely well. So there. But, no, it's, it's uh, I do think we have to be prepared to be, to fail. There's mercy in it. As long as you simply do your best, speak up. If you're in a democratic environment where there's no fear, you're going to be annihilated. And by the way, there is very real anxiety now in the United States that come uh, polling day in 2018, there will be people wearing red hats at polling booths in the Upper Plains, Michigan, Wisconsin, and elsewhere. It's already, it's already being organized. So that the mere sight of people wearing the red hats will keep people away from voting because they're too frightened. It's fear that will keep people from voting uh, against Donald Trump. I'm sorry? I'm, I took him. I'm telling a pack of lies. Uh, well, actually, I don't know how you would know that that's not true, but uh, the fact... You look at the Amer Okay, fair enough. Um, All right. Well, I, I can't say I'm. Uh, I think this hearing is rather worse than I even expected. Uh, you know, if, uh, as I said, there's rather, rather than an institute. Um, I don't know the gentleman there. This, this uh, class. I don't, I don't know what that, that means. Um, I was probably brought up in a uh, much poorer class than than you. Um, and this thing about this utopian ideal, we all sit down in a room when we come to this consensus, and we'll. Um, and again, there seems to be some sort of confusion here. Are we all going to sit right down in a room and reach this wonderful consensus, or are there irreconcilable differences? There are irreconcilable differences. It's part of the human condition to have irreconcilable differences. Uh, and what comes out of the left? They don't deal with arguments. I mean, Hitler, we have uh, you know, the, the, the camps, we have the gulag, uh, we have the China, uh, all these left-wing movements. Uh, they get rid of their opponents. If you don't agree with them, you're away. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want this come by our picture of the world, uh, we're sitting down resolving all your problems, good luck to you. I think there's some wisdom in what you've just said. Uh, I think that there isn't going to be a kumbaya moment. I agree with you. And um, I think if you had more time to speak your views, this is a hard time to do it. It's very compressed. It's hard to get things said. Uh, each person needs a lot more time than they're given. But no, I don't disagree with much of what you just said. Yeah. 
Um, I was thinking about two questions that you kind of put, and then you did answer them yourself. But one was um, why uh, nations can't apologize for some of the atrocities that mm -hmm. have been done. And the other is why there's this kind of phobia against psychological thinking. And uh, so I was thinking about the, the, na the one with nations. And you know, to do... You have to bear so much to, to, to think and to bear the feelings that go with what you come up with as thinking. And uh, for a nation to apologize, they have to kind of do the reverse of what a baby does as, uh, when they put together the good and bad mother, which is uh, put together the good and bad of themselves and trust that the bad isn't going to wipe out the good and bear all of that. That's a lot. Actually, it's a lot to ask of people. I know we should ask it, and I know that that is the ideal, but if you think about how much it, ha it takes to do, it's a lot. You see, I think it's actually a great relief to be able to apologize. I think that we're burdened by the inability to do it. Um, and to some extent, we need a certain kind of leadership, an example set by several world leaders. I mean, the Pope does this for us, you know. Uh, I'm not Catholic, but I must say now and then, and I don't agree with all the man says, but he does seem to be someone able to address emotional realities crimes by one country against others, <clears throat> speaking about um, good behavior, destructive behavior. Why is he the only one? I mean, um, God bless Olaf Palme. But, I mean, he's been under the ground for a hell of a long time. Where is the ethical leadership in Europe and the United States? Where are these? Where, where is it? What, what are we afraid of? I'm not saying I know the answer to this question, by the way. I'm raising the question because I think it's a question we all have to start to ask. What is our problem saying sorry? And uh, I think I'm going to have to say I'm sorry as well. Okay. <laughs> because... <laughs> There's been a lot about growing up, and, and of course when you grow up you have to accept limitations and losing things and, and come into terms with realities, and one of which is time. So, and I'm afraid, even with Christopher, we're good. So let's Thank you. Go.